I, I just want to ask Ryan one other question, if I could. I'm just so curious. And Isn't Michael, a good question? Well, we'll find out. You, you can answer the question, too, because I'm very <laughs> curious to know. And that is, that is, do you still listen to Christian music? <laughs> uh, I could, so, like, you know, put a little Smitty down, you know, just... I am um, Ryan, I really want to hear your answer to this because I have an answer. <laughs> you are listening to the Concierge Minister Podcast, a place to grow, learn, and be inspired as you discover God's purpose for your life. Here's your host, the pastor you've always wanted without the church, Dr. Kumar Dixit. Hey guys, welcome back. We're really excited about uh, this episode. This is what we call a crossover episode where, um, have you ever watched Law and Order or maybe the Chicago PD um, franchise where some of the actors go back and forth between different TV shows? So here we are. Um, I am going to be sharing the full podcast that we recorded for our podcast called Church for Atheist uh, podcast. We only used about 10 minutes of the interview with Ryan. For that podcast but i want you to be able to have access to the entire interview with ryan's so without further ado here you go michael we have our very first preacher for church for atheists podcast how exciting is that that is very exciting i i'm not sure are we going to be calling him a preacher <laughs> well let's well let's we'll find like out and i call it the sermon of the day is that what we're going to call it um exactly Ryan Bell is someone that I've known for over 20 years. We were both pastors, um, believe it or not. And um, I, I actually still remember like one of the last times I saw Ryan, we were both at one of those um, church conferences where we were just going to try to change the world like in a year. And then like within that year, I saw like a CNN article or and then started seeing all this news about Ryan um, thinking about becoming an atheist. And I was like, this can't be the Ryan that I know. And obviously I had to Google and I was like, I know that face. I was like, this is so sad. Ryan, the guy that I looked up to, the pastor who was going to change the world, this can't be. How's that for an introduction, Ryan? That's, guy, <laughs> That's a the, decent introduction. Yeah. The guy that disappointed me. Right? Um, yeah. You, so, you're not you, so you're in line. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. We're glad that you are are here. It's been at least five or six years since you um, had your experiment of um, kind of a year of of questioning your faith, um, yep. and then after that, you ended up deciding. And I remember it was like breaking news everywhere that um, your verdict was to leave the religion that that you kind of lived for and 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 grew up with. So, what's it been like since then? Oh, so many different things. Um, it's It's been a rebuilding, you know, it's been um, trying to figure out uh, a career, uh, you know, a sort of a goal in life to shoot for. Um, I, you know, everything for me was wrapped up in the church and my role in it and um, that desire to change the world that you just referred to. And so it, it's been... Um, it's, I can't believe six years has gone by, honestly. Um, so I, it's, been, it's been good. It's been healing time. Um, you know, losing a lot of friends, making a lot of new friends, all kinds of different twists and turns in my career path. Worked at a brewery for a little while. Oh, nice. Well, that's fun. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. We can talk so, about how being a bartender is like being a pastor. Oh, Okay. <laughs> No, are you have... a good bartender? <laughs> uh, I was a I was a beer tender, though I'm I'm a pretty decent bartender as well. Ah, see, that's so a career very, I can look into. <laughs> very, very interesting. Well, I I I remember that year when all this buzz was happening. I mean, th a lot of things happened all at once. I mean, you lost your job. I mean, like you didn't get to like have that year to even think about leaving religion. The religion just kicked you out like pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, if, if I remember right, you were um, also teaching at a, at a um, theological school and they let your contract go. So I, I think there was a whole bunch of things that just fell apart in your life. And one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you is, do you regret the way that all it all happened? Do you wish you would have had a better way for it to kind of 
be a little bit more sy systematic in how it unraveled instead of how it kind of just came pouring down. Yeah, I mean, if I had been a little smarter, I would have thought about a plan B career-wise. A lot of the pastors that I've known over the years were, you know, had a background in construction or they were teachers before or they, you know, had a science degree or something like that. And I was, you know, all in from day one. I was, uh, all my degrees are in theology or church leadership. And I think if I had to do it all over again and had a little bit more foresight, I would have um, thought about how I, I could prepare to make a smoother exit just financially. But I don't have any regrets about, uh, about it really overall because I, I had always said, uh, in fact, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Monty Saline, you know, and I had had numerous conversations over the years about me getting out. Like I, I wanted space. Um, and I want to draw a distinction here too between leaving the church and leaving my faith. So mm -hmm. the two were distinct events separated by nine months to two years. Um, and so when I was talking to Monty about stuff, um, it was about leaving the Adventist church or just leaving pastoral ministry. And he always convinced me that I could do more good staying in and um, change things from within. Um, and, and I, I, I believe that, you know, and so I was, I was in it as long as they would have me, I would say, you know, I, I, I said that I would stay until they wouldn't have me anymore. And a day came when they wouldn't have me anymore. And, and I left, and, but I didn't prepare myself for that. Um, and I don't honestly know how I could have done that. I don't think I could have gone to law school while still being a pastor without anybody noticing. Like, <laughs> right. <to> law school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You no, start moonlighting or something else just you know, <laughs> temporarily. Yeah. Exactly. Ryan I mean, L. J. D. Yeah, but that's the thing about that's the thing about religion though, right? I feel like when you're in, you kinda have to be all in. And so there's not really a lot of space, I don't think, to to kind of like have a backup plan. So did you I mean, did you kind of feel that conflict? Like having a backup plan was kind of like, you know, saying that you didn't have faith? Yeah, I mean, I think the backup plan that I thought I had was um, my interfaith relationships and my ecumenical relationships and that that would sort of catch me on my way down. <laughs> we we want to use the, the up and down sort of uh, matrix. But I found out that um, there wasn't really room for me in those denominations either. And uh, those relationships were, were fine as far as they went, but they weren't um, things that I could fall back on per se. Um, I mean, not even the universalists would like take you in. You know, the interesting thing, I mean, the, the biggest chance was like Episcopalian. I had really good friends in a, a very popular Episcopalian church here in Pasadena. And, you know, what people don't realize is that even after earning a doctorate and being an Adventist pastor for 20 years, I would have had to gone back to seminary to learn how to be an Episcopal Right. minister, right. you know, and if I wanted to become a Methodist, I would have had to go to seminary to be learn, learn how to be a Methodist minister. And I was like, I, I mean, I can pray, I can read the Bible, I know how to, you know, bless babies and baptize adults. And if you want me to baptize babies, I just figure out the two are similar enough, I can figure it out. You know? <laughs> right, right. I don't think so, you dunk them, though. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you just kind of like, think, yeah, just you, a little sprinkle. Sprinkle, yeah get a little squirt bottle and you're good to go. So Right, right, right. Uh, Ryan, so we've talked a lot about, obviously, the, the, the loss that you experienced. Um, there, I know that after six years, there's also been some gains. Like now that you can look retrospectively, what are some of the things that you're grateful for that, that happened out of this? I mean, I think most of the gains have to do with just my inner life. I, there's not that conflict inside of me to try to reconcile things that don't reconcile themselves. I don't have to believe things on behalf of other people. And I think this is unique to being a pastor. Uh, I, th I think my journey would have been very different had I just been, um, you know, a, a member of the church. But as a pastor, I had, there was an expectation, and you understand this, to, to hold a certain level of confidence in things that, frankly, you're not confident about and um, to sort of fake it and, and, frankly, lie about what you uh, believe is true or at least... Um, sort of lie by omission by the things you don't say. Yeah. So that was a huge mental load off to, to not have to pretend 
to believe certain things or to hide certain aspects of my life. You know, I'm, I'm a, a craft beer aficionado and I love good whiskey and I don't have to hide that anymore. I do whatever I want. Um, I can, uh, you know, my, my, my intellectual pursuits are, are, are broader and freer. I think I found out that some of my friends were really just church members. They, they weren't the friends I thought they were. And to be free of that, you know, at first that was painful. And I've, I've since come to see that as, as freedom. And I've made a lot of new friends that, um, that have been, you know, I have fewer friends, but the ones I have, I think are, are true. You know, the, there's not that um, sort of contractual agreement that you mm -hmm. end up having in, in uh, pastoral ministry. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does. And I, I, you know, we, we all have conflict with organized, um, well, with the organizations that we work with you know, or work for, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a nurse in a large sure. a company, you know, you have to ask yourself, okay, is, is this the organization stance on things and do I believe in it? And sometimes you have to toe the line. And I, and I remember very early on, I had a pastor mentor of mine teach me what he called the skill of fogging. Hmm. And he said, you know, he says, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to work through fogging. So when people ask you questions that you're not prepared to give them a direct answer, you're going to fog. And we actually <laughs> practiced fogging. I mean, it, it was lying, but we called it fog, fogging uh, for? all the time, all the oh time. My God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we even role played fogging just to make sure he knew I knew how to do it properly and not lose my job. So, it, you know, it exists. And uh, I've been doing that for years, I think. And when it finally came to a head, I was sitting down with the conference president and we had probably we had three long meetings, each one of them more than an hour, about a week apart. And one of those meetings, I think it was the third one. It had to have been the third one because where do you go after this? Uh, I finally said to him, you know, today is truth day. I've talked about this before. You may have heard me mm -hmm. talk about this. I said, you can ask me anything you want and I will tell you the truth. And he asked me lots of questions mm -hmm. and I told him the truth. And by the end of that, I wasn't an Adventist pastor anymore. <laughs> oh, what was the wow. most outrageous thing that he asked you? Um, you know, he asked me whether I believed in a six day literal creation. He asked me whether I believed that the oh, he went to church. basics. <laughs> yeah, the, the remnant sure. <laughs> yeah, he didn't he wasn't asking you what your favorite uh brew of, of, of beer was. <laughs> beer he was. did ask me about drinking. Did he? I'm oh sorry. of course. That's very important. I fessed up about that. But Ryan, yeah. you said something really interesting a while back when you were talking about, well, what Kumar now calls the fogging. I'm curious to know what, how much of that started even before you started questioning your faith. Mm -hmm. Like how much of it, like coming out of seminary, I would imagine sure. that every pastor or minister is doing a good chunk of that. And I wonder like, what's the balance between, you know, how much of that you were doing before you even started to question versus when you got closer to the end? Yeah, you know, it fell apart in pieces for me. I remember being at seminary and being really enchanted by evangelical uh, theology, uh, in particular about like New Covenant kind of theology. And it led me to question Sabbath and a few other things um, in Adventism. And I, I eventually reconciled, genuinely reconciled myself to an understanding of the Sabbath that wasn't tied into salvation or anything like that. Um, and then I remember when heaven and hell sort of went away for me and they didn't go away in the sense that I was like adamant trying to like convince people that they didn't exist. I just didn't really care about it. Um, and I didn't preach about it. So I, I used to tell people privately, people that I trusted, you know, if there's a heaven, that's like bonus, you know, it's like, awesome. We get to go. I mean, but I had no confidence that there was a heaven and, you know, Adventists don't really believe in hell anyway, uh, in the way that most people mean when they say that. So, I, so I kind of gave up on heaven and I thought, well, this is a distraction, you know, it keeps people, um, you know, in this otherworldly uh, phase. And um, so those little things fell apart. I didn't believe in, you know, creationism. That was a long time ago. I didn't really talk too much about that. Um, the farthest I got to that in, in sermonic form was to say that, you know, Genesis 1 and 2 wasn't about, uh, you know, a scientific explanation for the origins of, of uh, life on earth. Um, it was 
wasn't about that. It was about something else, which leaves open the question, you know, what, how did we get here? I didn't try to answer that. I'm not a scientist. And I thought, you know, that's not my concern. And I was never really that interested in the question of the sort of existence of God. I just, I took it as a um, sort of an axiom, but in a very light way. Like I knew a lot of atheist Jews who deployed their faith for social justice and they didn't really concern themselves about the question of God's existence. Um, and I, I sort of became a Christian like that. I, if people asked me if I believed in God, I would have said, sure, you know, I, I believe in God. And what is God? Well, I don't know. I was like an apophatic, you know, uh, uh, you know, Christian. I, I could tell you what God wasn't. I wasn't really able to tell you what God was. And I thought mm. that that negative theology for me was enough to say, like, I'm pretty sure God's not like a white man, um, And I don't think God is interested in America. I don't think God is interested in any country. Um, He's certainly not interested in the Eagles based on their performance. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. You were talking to the two least active sports people. So I mean, like, but I logged (laughs) Eagles football. I was tracking. Really? Because when he said Eagles, I, I was thinking of the band, and I was like, he's not old enough to know the Eagles. He must I, mean, I know the Eagles, but yeah. About sports or something. So. Yeah, some sports ball <laughs> reference. So, but, right, but that actually, that, so that is interesting because that's kind of what I assumed a lot of pastors are doing, right? You kind of even straight out of seminary. Right. Very few people I would imagine are having like a just wholesale bought into like all of the specifics. And so it sounds like that's kind of what you were living. So when you arrived at the point where you wanted to kind of like do the experiment of a year without God, like I must say, like the first I heard about it and I heard about it at the time, like everybody did because it was all over the place. I was already uh, at most an agnostic. And I was like, I don't think I understand this experiment. I'm so confused. You like, and everybody how, else. Like, what are you exploring? And, and just, the, just the nature, just the, the name of it was like, hmm, at this point, are you already not to the point where you don't believe? <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about, about that moment and what that was about for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I genuinely wasn't sure at that point. You know, I... I, I sometimes say that I wanted there to be a God, but I was du- highly dubious. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think if, if you had to ask me where was my mind at that moment, I was probably like right up against agnosticism. And I had been kind of a theological agnostic for a long time. Like there were things that mattered to me about theology and there was things that just didn't matter to me that much. If you wanted to ask me about like the seven seals in Revelation, I just didn't care about that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think for me, it was, I, I sometimes said, like w- one analogy I've used is, you know, when you go in to see a movie, like a science fiction movie, you, you suspend disbelief and enter the story mm-hmm. of that show, right? And, and I think Christianity requires that if you're going to really embrace it you have to suspend some disbelief um you know the resurrection if you believe in the virgin birth nobody's ever heard or seen anything like this before so there's no reference point for it so to believe in that you have to shut off a certain critical part of your brain in order to get your head around that so i i thought of my my year without god as a suspension of belief like the reverse of that like what if i just assume for the sake of argument that God doesn't exist, what will happen? Mm. Okay. What will happen in my physical life? Like, well, like, you know, I didn't to be, to be, you know, a little over the top about it. Like, will I be struck by lightning? You know, will uh, will I be super unhappy all of a sudden? Like I'll get super depressed and you know, God's not in my life anymore and bad things will start happening to me. My friends will abandon me. Will that happen? Um, um, But I didn't think that, I mean, I didn't really think that God was going to punish me, but I also thought, well, maybe God will show me some evidence or some reason to believe. So it was a suspension of belief in the hope that I might find some reason to believe. Mm -hmm. And it was, I spent the year exploring sort of the philosophical assumptions of atheism and philosophical naturalism. um, Because atheists, atheists don't like don't have a lack of belief about everything. They have convictions, they have beliefs. What do atheists believe? And, and then the second half of the year, I really spent like 
could I, I was a little disappointed that none of my friends really tried to talk me back into Christianity. I really thought someone would labor with me and be like, no, 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 check out this Bible verse or read this book. Or a few people said, read this book, but mostly it was super banal kind of stuff. Like you've never even read the Bible. And I was like, okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you need to uh, study more. Yeah. And right. Pray harder. Right. Yes. You know, so, um, so I, I tried to talk myself back into it by reading, I think like the smartest Christians I could find people that really understood the challenge of atheism and were Christians anyway. Um, people like Philip, um, Ooh, I can't think of his last name all of a sudden at Claremont, um, theological, um, yeah, some, you know, really, you know, C.S. Lewis famously, right. And, a few other apologists who weren't like, like the really annoying apologists, uh -huh. but, but smart apologists who understand the philosophical challenges, you know, the problem yeah. of evil. How do, how do intellectual Christians, you know, explain the problem of evil? How do, um, how do they navigate around um, the absence of God? So speaking, speaking of that, then, you know, one of the things in evangelical Christianity that is said over and over again, and I have said it, probably a few million times is that there's a there is a hole in people's heart you know there's a wormhole that is gnawing at your heart and that's the holy spirit that is god that is the vacancy of god and when people realize that that's god that's missing in their life they live the most fulfilled glorious life you know mm. and so basically what we've taught is you can't be a whole person until you fully understand kind of the greatness and majesty of God that's missing in your life. Hmm. Um, so now you're, you're on the other side of that, right? So, and what I just said, I know you understand because you grew up with that as well. Yeah. Totally. So, so is Not there a hole? Cool. Yeah. Is there a hole in your heart, yeah. Ryan? I mean, is there something missing? Do you feel a like. One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at him missing so much. I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I mean, is there a part of you that's kind of like, less, un, less happy now because you don't believe in God? Um, I'm definitely not less happy. I'm not, I'm not necessarily, well, yeah, it kind of depends. So I think everybody has a hole in their heart. Like, you know, we, the longing to be loved and to, to love and be loved, um, to be understood, to be seen. And I think, people can genuinely fill that hole with an idea of God. Um, I think one of the most um, moving things about like evangelical worship is this sense that we are loved unconditionally. And when you have that sentimental music playing and you're like singing to a father that maybe you never had, or even if you had a good father, like a hyper idealized version of that father, it feels really good to feel completely and com wholly loved um, unconditionally. And there are certain realities about life that you can't sugarcoat. So leaving religion is, there's no panacea, you know, like you're going to die and then that will be it. And you aren't un unconditionally loved by anyone. And that's a reality. And I think so for me, it's sort of like, and I don't mean this in any disparaging way that people who are Christians haven't grown up. But for me, it felt like growing up. It felt like um, realizing that you were paying your own rent, paying your own bills, your parents were somewhere else, and you were on your own. Like, mm. and in, you know, in that, in that example, they're still there. And, you know, you ask them to help you out and they help you out. But as you get a certain age, your parents die. And you, you find out you're on your own in the world. Like, there's no parents anymore and that's it. That's, that's just you. And that's a part of growing up. And I think what that God-shaped hole and filling it with the idea of God can do for people is make them feel connected to something universal. And that, that works for people, I think. I don't know that it makes it true. Mm -hmm. um, and I had come to the point in my life where I wanted... Um, something true, even if it was painful, rather than a lie that was comforting. Um, so there, there is an un, unequivocal, sort of unavoidable, uh, you know, facing the music when you when you step away from the security blanket uh, of God. Um, I, I'm so, something of a you know existentialist kind of person myself. I don't. I don't have, um, you know, I talk about faith, hope, and love sometimes. And I say like the first thing to go was faith. The next thing to go was hope. 
and I don't have a lot of hope, um, really. I mean, it all depends on the scale. You know, sure. on small scale, you know, I have a lot of hope about various different items of my life. But grand scale, I don't really have a lot of hope that, like, for example, America's going to get its act together and stop being racist and mm-hmm. um, yeah. imperialist. I don't have a lot of hope that um, human beings are going to start loving one another. Uh, although in small, case, small situations, I see that kind of thing happening. Um, but we can love each other, whether we have faith or hope. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, Paul was right, I think, that love is the supreme uh, value, and we don't need faith and hope to love. And yeah, yeah. that's well that's, said. That's kind of yeah, right. no, absolutely. And I think that so that resonated with me a lot. And I think for me, and it may not be you know completely accurate, but for me, I think the difference between people who usually can kind of stomach leaving the church and being agnostic or atheist really are the people who are comfortable with the well with the unknown or with not having any particular kind of hope or or accepting that you know at the afterlife maybe life yeah. just ends and that like so there are people i know that when i say that to them they i mean you can see that they get so stressed about the idea that there's no afterlife whereas for me it literally means nothing i'm like well if you just die and that's the end then that's just the end i wonder if you feel that same way you said you don't have a lot of any kind of big global kind of hope how do you feel about that is it just neutral <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, that's a great question because I've actually come even gone even further than that in my understanding. And I really feel the idea of eternal life actually minimizes our opportunity to live a full life. Um, that meaning and fulfillment and joy um, happens in the context where there's a great deal at risk. Um, mm. And, you know, if you're playing a video game, for example, and you could never die, there's no real challenge to the game. Um, and of course, in a video game, you just start it over and play again, um, which is kind of the Christian version of the video game, right? Like you, right. you do your best, you die, you get to start over. Um, right. Maybe and, you get to start over. <laughs> but, I, but when you think about the things that you love the most in life or the things that you value the most, uh, part of that value is based on the scarcity of it or the uh, indefinite nature of it. And, and I think we need to be finite in order to live, to really live a, li- a life as a life. Um, I'm stealing right now from, uh, from, from a book that uh, has become my very favorite uh, book on this topic um, by a Yale professor named Martin Hagland called This Life. I don't know if you can see that or not, but yeah, uh-huh. uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend this. It's called This Life's uh, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. I, I didn't plan to do that, but, you know, it's... Well, it's I'm getting um, <laughs> It's so good. I've, I had him on my podcast. You can listen to my interview with him on my podcast at Life After God. Um, but he really makes the argument um, so cogently that we cannot... Any religious system that postulates uh, eternal life really is not living... Uh, sort of advancing a full and and a complete experience of life. In fact, Christians, just to use that example, um, when they, when they mourn the loss of their loved ones or when they're fearful of death, they're they're actually living a secular life. Mm -hmm. Um, They understand intuitively that this life matters. Mm -hmm. And the idea that this life matters is a secular idea. Um, and it's driven by the idea that we, we don't have forever and we need to value the moments that we do have. You know, that, that reminds me of uh, kind of the, the religion of, of Sikhism. You know, they, mm-hmm. they don't believe yeah. in reincarnation or they don't believe in eternal life. They just believe that you know, when I talk to my Sikh friends, you know, they're so comfortable with the idea that this is the one life that you have. Yeah. And, so, and so make it the best and do the best to care for others be justice and, you know, and demonstrate love on this earth because this is the one and only chance that you have. And I think you are right. You know, there's, when you live with that kind of worldview, you're going to be the best that you can be because you don't get to start over. You don't get to put a quarter in the machine and and have a do over again. Right. Yeah. And this is the heart of humanism really, which is how I primarily identify in terms of my philosophical worldview. Um, And it, 
humanism to me means that um, that we're the we're the ones that we're waiting for. You know, there's no one coming to save us, and we're it. So um, there's no rescue plan unless we craft one. Mm -hmm. And the world we leave to our children is the one that they're going to inherit. And there's no um, you know backdoor exit. So. I think it, it puts things in such relief, you know, in such stark relief. And it, ma it makes you care about things in a deeper way. It's, it's hard to explain because I know a lot of Christians would say they care, you know, as much as I do about the world. And I believe them uh, to a point. Um, but, but I think until you've really seen the world from this perspective, um, every, it's so precious. And I, I, I think I value it even more than I did before. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, that resonates. <laughs> it definitely resonates with me. You are listening to the Concierge Minister Podcast with Kumar Dixit. Coming up. But it's an interesting point in the sense that I think when I, you know, on my way out the religious door, I had made Jesus into the thing that I needed Jesus to be in order to do what I needed to do, which was not sort of a miraculous savior, but a teacher of goodness. So yeah. along those lines now and valuing the world and I think that, you know, humanism and your approach seems like it would lead to just valuing people and personal connection um, and making sure that you're kind of being, you know, the, the best person you can be and you're kind of really kind of pushing for global human flourishing as much as possible. So does that inspire you to kind of keep going and like what do you view as your inspiration so when you wake up in the morning what are the things that you're super excited about that inspire you in the world you see you know every yeah day? it's a because great question nothing, because nothing can inspire you unless you have jesus that's right uh, <laughs> right okay noted kumar now let's hear from ryan <laughs> yay jesus well it, you know it's an interesting I know you're joking, but it's an interesting point in the sense that I think when I, you know, on my way out the religious door, I had made Jesus into the thing that I needed Jesus to be in order to do what I needed to do, which was not sort of a miraculous savior, but a teacher of goodness, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that was the Jesus that like you, that Jesus is in the Bible too. Um, so, so to me, the, the, the inspiration is um, the struggle for, for justice and equality. And um, as you said, human flourishing. And I do think, even though I don't hold out a whole lot of hope in this, in the, in the sense that um, I think it's a, a foregone conclusion or that we're going to get to the other side, um, you know, as, as Martin Luther King Jr. popularized uh, the expression, um, the arc of the universe bends towards justice. Uh, I don't believe that. Anymore, I don't believe the arc of the universe bends by nature or or sort of in an eschatological way towards towards justice. I think we have to bend it, and there's a possibility we don't bend it, and it stays the way it is or gets worse. Um, so so that's what inspires me. I, I fight for tenant justice. One of my um, primary outlets here in Pasadena is I, I'm a, an organizer with the tenants union. And we were stri striving uh, for equality and fairness in housing. Um, I work at the Secular Student Alliance. That's my day job. And I uh, work with students who are trying to make a difference on their campus. Um, did, did I read that you're a, like a, a chaplain for secular or atheists on, on, <clears throat> on college campus? Yeah, I'm at USC um, here okay. in Los Angeles as the humanist chaplain. And, and again, you know, Students, you know, more and more, like probably close to 40% now of uh, young, like college age young adults are uh, nuns, as they say, the, mm -hmm. the non-religious, or they don't identify with any particular religious orientation. It doesn't mean they don't believe in God or they don't have some kind of spiritual uh, idea of how the world is or whatever. Uh, but they don't, they're not, they wouldn't say, oh, I'm Jewish or I'm Muslim or I'm Hindu or I'm Sikh or I'm Buddhist. They, they're just like, eh, none of the above. And, and a lot of them don't have a belief in the supernatural. They don't believe that there's anything out there beyond what we can see, or I sometimes say the things that we can see or the things that we could, could see if we had strong enough instruments, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, I work with, with students, non-religious students on campus. And, and the goal there is the same, you know, it's how do we form um, 
good lives? How do we live good lives? What does it mean to be an accountant, but not just an accountant, if that's your career path, but someone who's a, an accountant that lives for the sake of the world, for the goodness of the world. Um, and some, some professions lend themselves more to that type of orientation. Some people yeah. become nurses and doctors because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and I, th- I think th- those are the, the things that inspire me. Um, my, my politics is very much oriented around the same thing. I, I think politics is a kind of, um, to me, politics is about people coming together and solving problems that they share together, um, whether that's as simple as how do we cross the street safely uh, all the way up to, you know, how should we be in relationship to China? Um, yeah. You know, all of that is, is politics. And human beings long, long ago learned how to be cooperative and discovered that cooperation was um, stronger sometimes than competition, uh, maybe even most of the time. And, and I think politics is about trying to figure that out, trying to figure out, like, how can we cooperate for the betterment of everyone and understanding that the betterment of everyone might mean sacrificing a little bit of something that I have, but in the end means that we all get to thrive. So for me, politics is, is, is kind of everything. Um, mm-hmm. I think everything is politics and politics is everything. I, mean, I know people will cringe when they say that, when, it, when I, they hear that because they think like a political campaign, you know, like yeah. Biden versus Trump. Right. And that can be very soul sucking. But even but you- that is important because it's a struggle for who has power. And one of the options is not nobody. Like one of the options on the table is not nobody has power. Somebody has power. And those people that have power are going to make decisions that affect all of us. And so we either have it or we don't have it. And so I think at a very base level, um, you know, my my day is spent trying to uh, fight for power for people who don't have it. You know, what's really interesting, Ryan, is... um, the Apostle Paul, you know, before he became the Apostle, you know, he was Saul, and um, he was very fervent, he was, you know, just go-get-it personality, you know, he was just doing it all like crazy, and what's interesting is after he had his conversion experience, um, his personality still stayed the same, he was still as fervent, he was still crazy, he was still going at 100, you know, 50 miles an hour, but just had a different outlook in life, Mm. and as I'm listening to you, I think it's so interesting because, you know, you've had kind of a conversion or a deversion, if, if I can call it that. And, but the person that I know from 20 years ago is still the same Ryan, you, mean, yeah. the, you know, the same issues of justice and equality and, and trying to help the refugee and, you know, all the stuff that you did in, in Pennsylvania is still the same Ryan that I know that is living out, you know, in, in California. So it's really interesting how, you know, there's still that similar arc. I appreciate you saying that because I, I, I feel the same way. Um, sometimes people that, even people that I knew pretty well, but a lot of times people that I didn't know that well, they, they take this change in me um, as like the biggest thing in the world. And I, after six years, I, I almost forget, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not really that big of a deal to me. Right. And um, someone the other day, the uh, friend of mine, who's also a former um, Adventist and probably agnostic uh, said, you know, I hope I don't, you know, if you don't mind, I wish you a happy Sabbath. And it was like earlier today, actually. And I was like, huh, Friday night. Yep. I guess it is. I mean, it just totally doesn't even occur to me anymore. Wow. Um, That's so funny. Cause I was like <laughs> going crazy today, trying to mow my lawn before the sun went down. So. <laughs> Which I think is actually a fine practice and <laughs> absolutely fine. Very restorative <laughs> of your soul. It's good. Yeah. I've, I've often... I, mean, I totally identify with that whole thing you're saying too about, you know, people, it's like when people assume that, you know, so if you're no longer a believer in Jesus, then you must be like just full of sin and hateful. And there's this big question. Well, how could you be good without God? And I, fi- that's probably one of the most annoying questions that I get. Um, I love turning I that question around example. and yeah. <laughs> and saying like, if you if you don't know what's good unless God tells you, then that's you know pretty concerning. problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. problematic yeah. at best. And so I think that's why you're the same. It's because you're good and your values are your values and they always were. So you yeah, know, that's that's a good point. Would change over time. That's a good point. Um, 
I think it was probably 1997 or 1998, I was on an airplane uh, to Barbados. I was doing a pre-trip for a mission trip because Barbados, of course, needs missions. Oh, and, and, and we uh, do. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I was with my mentor, and he said, you know what's so amazing, Kumar, is our little sliver of faith as Christians, and especially as Seventh-day Adventists, you can go anywhere in the world show up to a church and you're like family like it doesn't mm. matter it, it's just something so beautiful and redemptive that you can go anywhere in the world and just say hey i'm a christian and they will they will have you at church they will take you out to eat you know they, they will love you they will just care for you and and i know that i live in my bubble as a christian and i you know pretty much everyone i hang out with socially are my Christian friends that I grew up with, you know? And so now that you've kind of had this divorce from Christianity and that was your, your bubble exploded, um, where do you find your community now? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, if I'm being totally honest, I don't have a regular experience of community. Okay. Um, there are secular communities uh, that meet, in various places around the country. There's a few here in Los Angeles. And I just haven't felt the draw personally. Um, I think my the biggest answer to that question is probably the, the people I organize with in the Tenants Union. Mm -hmm. um, these are you know people who I struggle alongside for justice um, here locally. And my neighborhood has become more my community which I think is, is kind of this organic thing, you know? It wasn't like an artificial community that was built to be a community. Um, atheists do this too, especially atheists that are former Christians. They, they want to build a community. And it's, it's like a community for the sake of community, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that if you can sustain it. Um, but I think by the time I left the church, I was really exhausted by being in the role of the person who had to whip up this sense of community or really work to bond these people together. And I think I was just tired of that. And, um, and of course COVID has really put the kibosh on all sorts of, you yeah. know, experiences of community. So uh, let me ask, let me ask you this, you know, when you go into any random church, it doesn't matter what denomination is Yeah, like a good 60 to 70 people, 70% 70 of the people are just weird. Like you just got like weird, crazy church people that you got to deal so with. So that is true. <laughs> hey, I, as a pastor for 25 years, I Hi. have <laughs> ministered to socially defunct individuals. You're the um, weirdest person in your, in your former church. But anyway. <laughs> so my question is, is that the same in like humanism and atheism? Like when you go to and have your little like atheist potluck, are they just all like bizarre weirdos as well? Yeah, they're, they're odd, you know, and I think people that, um, I, in fact, I was giving a talk once in San Diego at a gathering like that. And um, I looked around and I didn't really have any notes planned. It was a really small informal gathering and they wanted me to speak for like five or six minutes. So I was like, mm. I'm not going to write anything down. I'm just going to get up there and, and I don't know, whatever hits me. So I'm there and I'm starting to think like, okay, what am I going to say? <clears throat> and I'm looking around and you know, it's people with like Star Trek t-shirts and <laughs> people like socially awkward a little bit, fine. <laughs> and which is totally fine. Right. Yes. And, and people who become like armchair experts about anything are a little like weird, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I've, I, I read endlessly about like socialism and economics and, and racism, like, it's yeah. not normal. Right, right. right. Like people yeah. don't do that. I mean, I don't, I don't know very many people to do that. Yeah. Uh, so I stood up to this, I stood up in front of this group and I'm like, let's be honest. We're the ones who were outcast in high school, right? Like, can we all just admit <laughs> that like, we're the ones that were just like kicked in, in, in PE class, you yeah. know, and last one um, picked in dodgeball. And I'm curious yeah. to know if they agreed. <laughs> they were laughing. Yeah, everybody sort of laughed. And it was a risk. I was definitely taking a risk that they yeah. might be. I didn't know them personally, most of them. Um, but yeah, they, they, it, I, it just hit me like these are people who are, and I, I think that's the genius also of, of um, 
of Christianity, the way I think Jesus is portrayed in the gospels is that he is the, the champion of the down and out and the, the losers and the weirdos. Hmm. And I think that's, what's beautiful about authentic communities um, is that you don't pick these people. These aren't like hmm. the 10 most handsome, beautiful, sexy people, you know, and then you pull them together and that's your group. These are just right. people, yeah. right. Who are drawn together by something else. In the case of Christianity, it's, uh, you know, a commitment to Jesus and the cause that Jesus stood for and invited people to follow him after. And in humanism, it's a sort of a commitment to human potential and our, our responsibility to make the world a better place, whether it's, if it's tenants rights, it's honestly, the tenants union is a perfect example. Tenants union, people who come to the tenants union are people who can't pay their rent. Mm. People who say the rent's too damn high. And that's, a cross section of everybody and it's uh, multiracial uh it's all different economic and well not so much economic i guess but um all different um like career and academic achievements mm. all to, all up and down the range and and these are just comrades you know these are people who share a need for solidarity um in order to live yeah that's well said Michael, I, I think we want to end with a little uh, Q&A with um, Ryan. But before we do, can I ask um, Ryan? I just want to ask Ryan one other question, if I could. I'm just so curious. And Is it Michael, a good question? Well, we'll find out. You, you can answer the question, too, because I'm very <laughs> curious to know. And that is, that is, do you still listen to Christian music? Uh, I could, so, like, you know, put a little Smitty down, you know, just... I am um, mine. I really want to hear your answer to this because I have an answer. <laughs> I, I don't on purpose, but I'm not opposed to it. Okay. Um, I, I have a, I don't use iTunes much anymore. I listen to Spotify mostly, but if I'm uh, ever like just on iTunes or like I'm renting a car, I don't have a car with Bluetooth, but if I rent a car and my phone connects, it just automatically starts playing my old playlist. And there's a lot of Dave Crowder band on there. Ah, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's really, uh, really well done. Like he's an incredible musician and that band, I don't know if they're still together or not. Um, really talented guys. Um, and there's some really thoughtful um, Christian music that um, I still listen to you too. That's a Christian band, right? Yeah, they're the original Christian band. Right. Um, R.E.M., you know, all those guys that are asking the big questions. Um, but it, you know what's funny that will amuse you and your guests is that sometimes as I'm doing the dishes or cooking, um, I will start humming something before I'm aware of it. And it's a hymn invariably. <laughs> and the other day it was to God be the glory, if you can imagine. And I was like, of all the things, of all the things, <laughs> <that goes from. laughs> like, like I am like philosophically opposed to that song on principle, you know, like, yeah. no, like you should be proud of what you've accomplished. Don't give all the glory to God. Like, <laughs> Well, that that uh, just shows that just shows that great God-sized hole in your heart. <laughs> Yo, what it shows is a lot of brainwashing. I was so, gonna say the depth of the brainwashing. Yeah, because so listen to this, and now this you totally stole my my confession for for tomorrow was going to be about this. So today I went to our local Christian bookstore because though I am you know not a, a Christian anymore, I am very much a vegetarian. So I need to you know you got to go stock up, stock up on all of your soy protein so i'm walking through the store and before i know it you know i'm like really really vibing with you know the song forever <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like and like 30 seconds into it i was like oh my god this is my confession this week <laughs> because i was loving it i was like every single lyric i was like it's such a good song yeah. which one is that which song uh, forever god is faithful kumar oh Hussain. right yeah, time. there's some really great songwriting, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, one of the songs that um, was like a theme song for me during Year Without God, um, that not a Christian song, but um, this song that was popular that year, 2014, uh, Say Something, the, the lyrics are, are like, say something, I'm giving up on you. Mm. And I remember the first time I heard it, I was in the car. And um, it's a beautiful melody, first of all. And so I was just instantly like drawn to the melody. It has a worship song quality to it, <laughs> lyric, like, like melodically. 
And then these lyrics come on and I'm just like, just bawling. Like I'm just like in tears because I'm thinking this is exactly my prayer uh, mm. during this year, you know, say something, you know, anything. Um, wow. I would have followed you the lyrics. Is, I would have followed you anywhere. Yeah. That's amazing. That really is. It's by the music the... is powerful. Ryan, w- would you be willing to, since you are our first um, preacher, would you be willing to allow us to do a real quick Q&A with you, kind of a little would you rather game? Sure. And if, and if, if, if it works out, we'll probably do this with other people. So you're, it, there's a lot of pressure for you. I'm the guinea pig. It's make or break, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I'll try not yeah. to screw it up. <laughs> all right. All right. Perfect. Would you rather watch Netflix or go on a hike in the woods? Hmm. Right now, I'd rather go on a hike in the woods. Okay. I've been watching uh, a lot of Netflix. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. What are, you, what are you watching on Netflix right now? Right now, I'm watching The Politician. Oh, okay. Ooh, I have that uh, on my list. So I haven't yeah, started it's really, it it's very darkly funny, which is right up my alley. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, would you rather phone somebody or text somebody? Text. Text. Okay. He doesn't even have uh, his phone on. <laughs> ex- I did hear a ding somewhere. So <laughs> yeah, Michael, I think that, that was my girlfriend's computer. Sorry uh, about how that. how rude. Okay. Uh, would you rather take a shower or a bath? Oh, a shower. A bath yeah. is such a pain. So gross. Who wants to sit in your own bleh? And yeah. it's a waste of water. It's not it's very disgusting. It's like disgusting. if I'm going to do that, I want a hot tub. And then I'll take a shower. You know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the shower is still going to happen. <laughs> I think it's it's just so sick. And we, you, I've only seen this in the movies where people like, like you know, like like the hopeless romantic like puts her head underneath the, the all the water in the tub. That is disgusting. That's all I'm going to tell you. Okay? Definitely don't open your eyes. <laughs> that is that is not hygienic <laughs> at all. Okay. No. Um, would you rather watch Game of Thrones or Homeland? Game of Thrones. Okay. Would you rather Instagram or Twitter? Oh, Twitter. Uh, why, why is that? I know. That's all like it had a little bit of disdain there. Yeah, I well, know. Instagram. I, I, was, I do Instagram for a variety of reasons, and it's just very um, time-consuming for me. It's, okay. it, takes, it takes a while, and you can't link anything in the comments. You have to do the link in the bio, and then you got to do the bio. And, and you can't use a freaking computer. you got to like do it on your phone. That's right. So you're pecking, pecking, pecking. And uh, it just takes too much time, and but it is the most. Uh, I think it gets the most traction right now. I think yeah. most people are using yeah. Instagram, so I'm, I'm, I definitely do it. But I don't take pretty pictures, and I don't like do story very often. And yeah, I, I'm one of the few people left on Facebook. Like it's it yeah. is it oh, is you're an OG. <laughs> so it's I'm like an OG to- too. it is totally reminiscent reminiscence of uh, reminiscent of. Um, what, what what did Google have My back space? in the day? <laughs> MySpace. <laughs> oh, no, Google, right. Google, Google, Google Plus. Hang out. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, no one is there. It's like just me. It's like, like anyways. Uh, would you rather wear boxers or briefs? Boxer briefs. Oh, interesting. That was not an option, sir. <laughs> uh I, I just realized this is kind of inappropriate sexual harassment question, Michael. Why did you add this to the question? It is not. We want to if, know if Ryan is wearing if, boxes or briefs. If we had a female on All the show, we want to know. <laughs> <laughs> neither. All right. Uh, most important question. Uh, would you rather drink beer or wine? Ooh, that is such a hard one. Uh, at the end of the day, wine. Okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know, but... <laughs> of course not. Right. Back, the real back. answer is whiskey, though. Right. Okay. So, so I, I hear whiskey like burns your throat. Why would you do that? I, my girlfriend and I believe that it keeps us healthy through the winter. Like mm-hmm. an ounce or two of whiskey every night before you go to bed kills really? whatever. Yeah, it's great. Well, I like COVID. The burn a little bit. And if you have better whiskey, there's less burn. Okay, so Michael is a nurse, so I'm going to ask the, the medical professional, what, what do you think about that? I think that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's alcohol. Alcohol kills germs. Yeah. COVID. You know when you get start to get a cold and there's that little sting yeah. in the back of your throat and you're like, oh, knocks God, it right I'm out. getting sick. Mm-hmm. And I just take a, like a, an ounce of whiskey and knocks it right out. Really? Okay. Well, See, this I is all telling Timothy, you need a little bit of whiskey for, <clears> your, <throat> for your throat. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Hey, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your 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 sermon, and really, thank you for just being authentic and and being honest with us. It, My pleasure. To catch up with you. Thanks for listening to the Concierge Minister Podcast. If you want to learn more about growing in your faith or looking for an online faith community for support while you're on your journey, please visit concierge or send us an email at concierge at gmail.com. Don't forget to click the subscribe button and give us a five-star rating. If you find this podcast helpful, please tell your friends about us. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, go and live your best life.